in a couple of minutes. Perfect. So hi, everyone. My name is Nina Resikova. I'm a physician at Boston IVF, and I'm happy to host this um, live session for everyone. Um, it's a live webinar uh, for folks joining us on Facebook. Hello. Um, for folks joining in on Instagram, welcome and uh, happy Pride Month. Um, here we are June 1st. So we thought we'd kick it off um, with a presentation uh, on donor sperm and LGBTQ plus family building this evening. Um, and that is one of my uh, my areas that I uh, specialize in here at Boston IVF is LGBTQ plus family building. So very happy to host this this evening. If you all have any questions, um, you can start putting them in the chat. Uh, same thing goes for Facebook and Instagram. If you have any questions, um, just drop them there and um, we'll, I'll be able to answer them um, kind of real time. But I'd start just giving by giving everybody a little bit of an overview um, just into some background about our clinic, um, about the treatment options that we offer, a little bit about specifically treatment with donor sperm and use of donor sperm, things that you may want to consider. Um, and then uh, probably do that for about 10 or 20 minutes and then uh, kick it off into the live Q&A so you can get your questions answered. Okay, so let's jump in. Okay, happy Pride Month <laughs> once more and welcome. All right, so a little bit about me. Um, so I'm originally from Toronto, Canada. Um, and then I went to college um, at McGill University in Montreal, and then I migrated to the U.S. Uh, for my medical training. Um, just wanted to give you an understanding a, a little bit about what it takes to become a reproductive endocrinologist or fertility physician. So you guys have a little bit of understanding of um, what is the sort of educational background of a fertility specialist. So I went to uh, a medical school at Texas Tech out in West Texas, um, and then I uh, went to do my residency training in obstetrics and gynecology at the Johns Hopkins University uh, Hospital in, ba in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. Um, all fertility specialists are trained as OBGYNs first, and then we subspecialize and we do our reproductive health training, um, and I did mine at Boston IVF and then joined on as faculty uh, in 2017. So that is a little bit about me. Um, and we are affiliated with Harvard Medical School. So we um, are a teaching site as well. We do train medical students, residents, and fellows at Boston IVF. So we really believe that giving back to the educational environment is super important. And so we participate in all levels of training. And of course, we're affiliated with the Beth Israel Hospital, and that's uh, now Beth Israel Lady Health. So a little bit about what you all should be looking for when you're looking for a fertility specialist. Um, there's a lot of things actually, you know, for everybody, everybody has some slightly different priorities. I mean, obviously you wanna think about who you might wanna work with, the, the team. Um, and you also want a center that's gonna treat you with respect, um, recognize uh, your relationship. And of course, a center that has a lot of availability uh, of various treatment options and a lot of experience with uh, treating patients who are seeking um, either single parenting by choice with donor sperm or potentially LGBTQ couples. A little background about Boston IVF. Um, we've been treating um, a diverse array of patients, including LGBTQ patients since our inception. Um, so we have a lot of experience um, with working with couples um, or in, in individual or single patients um, who are navigating this journey. And ultimately, we hope to be your partner in the process of family building. A couple of other softer criteria, also very, very important, is you want a center that accepts your insurance plan. Um, and we are proud to partner with a lot of insurance uh, plans, including uh, some of the more progressive plans uh, that um, are very comprehensive in coverage. And you want a center that has good proximity. Um, we are very happy that we can offer care across New England, also in New York State and lots of other um, states as well. Um, so proximity is very important when you're looking for a center. So check out our website and um, hopefully we are able to service uh, a location close to you. So people often ask, what is a reproductive health checkup? Um, what am I signing up for if I'm registering as a new patient? Um, so first and foremost, it's going to be an appointment with a reproductive health specialist. Um, that could be, um, if you're looking for something expedited, potentially one of our nurse practitioners or PAs who are specialty trained. Um, or it could be one of our um, reproductive endocrinology and infertility physicians, typically about an hour. And that's because it takes a lot of time to assess your reproductive health. Um, and particularly if you're presenting with a partner, it is kind of an in-depth interview about both of your histories. 
Um, we'll review plans for fertility testing. So what kind of fertility testing is indicated for your specific uh, case? And then we'll also review some potential treatment options. So what kind of considerations might we have? What could the pathway and what can the timeline look like? And then you can also set up a uh, time to speak with our financial coordinators who can review your health insurance if you have coverage for treatment um, or review costs uh, for uh, treatment. And then we have um, each of our providers, each of our physicians works with um, a dedicated nursing team. So after uh, consultation, you'll have an opportunity to touch base with the nursing team, uh, ask any questions about the testing and actually schedule, uh, schedule the testing uh, and get started with your reproductive health evaluation. So we at Boston IVF um, have been around since the 1980s, and we are a full spectrum fertility care center. That means we can um, obviously do your fertility evaluation, do your testing, and we do offer a broad range of treatment options from not aggressive at all, all the way to very aggressive, including IVF treatment, egg donation and surrogacy. So we do offer um, all of those uh, testing options. So if you are interested in treatment, um, you know, definitely chat with us about what's available. I think you'll be uh, pleasantly surprised about our range of treatment offerings. So we're gonna go into a little bit more of the fertility workup, because I think that's something that a lot of you would wanna learn more about. Um, potentially some of you joining in have um, already participated in a fertility workup, or maybe had some testing with your OBGYN or your primary care doctor. Uh, but let's review it a little bit and talk about why, um, the, why we do these tests and what kind of information we can learn from these tests. Okay. So if you are somebody who's assigned female at birth, has a uterus and ovaries, and we're going to be ordering a pelvic ultrasound. Eventually, these are done transvaginally, if you're comfortable with that, um, because the anatomy is quite small. In many cases, the uterus is you know, fairly small if you've never been pregnant before. And then the ovaries can be as small as two centimeters. So we're talking tiny, maybe the size of a, a quarter or a little bit larger. And so uh, in some cases, they're quite a bit larger and they can be seen transabdominally, but for many patients are small and are difficult to see that way. So we recommend a transvaginal scan. At that time, we're gonna be counting the number of potential eggs developing on the ovary. That's called an antral follicle count. And we'll also be um, evaluating the uterus for any fibroids or any anatomic abnormalities and looking at the ovaries, seeing if there's any cysts on the ovaries or any abnormalities. So that is the purpose of the ultrasound. If you're not comfortable with the transvaginal ultrasound, just tell your provider, we can do a trans abdominally. You just need to have a full bladder um, and we can uh, do our best to evaluate the anatomy that way. Okay. There's some blood work as well. Um, some of the key um, elements of blood work that you have probably read a little bit about um, is the ovarian assessment. And for that, we use a couple of tests. We use the day three testing, uh, testing that's done time to your reproductive cycle. If you are um, if you do get regular cycles, or we can do it at random if you don't get regular cycles. And don't worry about that if that's an issue that you're concerned about. Um, the testing consists of uh, a test called the FSH, follicle stimulating hormone. We check that against the estrogen level as well. And then primarily the main hormone of interest for us is the anti-malarian hormone, the AMH. And that's a really important assessment um, of your ovarian activity and how it relates to other people in your age group. So really critical test um, and something that we, we like to have assessed or retracted every year um, in order to see if there's any interval change. Some prenatal labs, if you're intending to become pregnant, very important to make sure that your blood count is good, um, that you don't have any antibodies in your bloodstream, um, that you're immune to childhood vaccinations, and that we also require STD testing for all of our patients doing treatment. Um, your doctor will probably also talk with you about genetic testing. Um, genetic testing is indicated for most patients pursuing fertility treatment, and it's important to have a genetic panel done to understand which donor you may want to work with or which donor may be a candidate, may be a choice, because um, donors are screened with large genetic panels, actually. In most cases, donors are screened with genetic panels that range in 200, maybe 300 genetic conditions. And if they come back as a carrier for a condition, you want to know if you're a carrier for that condition, if your child could be at risk of developing that condition. So genetic testing is important. And according to what your goals are, you may be offered sort of different panels of genetic testing, but it's important to have some insight into whether you're a carrier for cystic fibrosis, spinal muscular atrophy, 
and then other hosts of um, genetic disorders that are more common in certain populations, such as the Ashkenazi Jewish population or potentially um, the Mediterranean population or the Asian population where certain conditions are a little bit more common. If you're electing to proceed with donor sperm, you'll probably be tested for CMV as well. Um, CMV stands for cytomegalovirus, and it's a virus that a lot of us have had exposure to. Um, it can be transmitted through many different mechanisms. It can be sexually transmitted, but usually, uh, but not the majority of the time. Um, and those of us who work in healthcare um, and uh, childcare uh, are typically more likely to be positive or have exposure to this or have antibodies against it. And if you're negative for it, your provider may recommend that you choose a CMV negative donor who's never been exposed to this uh, virus as well. So that's kind of gives you the background of some of the blood work that would be recommended. Then there's also another evaluation that would likely be recommended before considering moving forward with donor sperm, particularly insemination with donor sperm. And that's a test called the HSG or hysterosalpingogram. Um, that's a study where dye is passed into um, the uterus by passing a little catheter. So that's what you're seeing. You're seeing that straight line at the bottom. That straight line is the catheter that's passing through the cervix and instilling dye into the uterus. And you can see the uterus is labeled. It's roughly an upside down triangular shape. That's a normal appearing uterus. And then you can see that dye um, in a sort of a curly Q fashion passing through the right and left fallopian tube. So those are normal patent fallopian tubes that are allowing the dye to pass through. And the dye is radio sensitive, and we take pictures of the dye passing through the anatomy with x-ray. So we're able to have a really good understanding of um, the inside contour of the uterine anatomy, as well as the patency of the fallopian tubes. A really good study, and I would strongly recommend that you have this done prior to pursuing donor sperm insemination. Very, very helpful information and essentially gives you a safety check to understand that you are not wasting your time, you know, in the setting of tubal blockage. It's really a shame if tubal blockage is diagnosed after many treatment cycles have been completed because sperm at the end of the day is pretty costly. So um, some people will opt to do treatment at home after completing this type of fertility workup, or some people may just opt to do um, donor insemination at home, you know, with their partner uh, doing the insemination. And uh, that's okay, but it's not as successful. And there is a lot of benefit to doing a fertility checkup prior to starting treatment, including home insemination. Um, so you can learn a little bit more about the pros and cons of both approaches, but also to review your medications to make sure that your medications are pregnancy safe. Uh, to manage any underlying health conditions, to optimize your health before becoming pregnant, and ultimately preconception counseling, making sure you're taking a prenatal vitamin, making sure that your lifestyle habits are, are appropriate for becoming pregnant. And then there's a lot of people who have gynecologic conditions, which they may not understand the full impact of on their fertility. So assessing for uterine fibroids, ovulatory problems such as PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is actually the most common cause of ovulatory dysfunction, and also endometriosis, which is an inflammatory condition that affects the success of fertility treatment and may um, impact the fallopian tubes as well. So for all these reasons, very important to get a fertility checkup, even if you just find out that everything is you know, kind of optimal and you can go ahead and get started. Um, these are very helpful things. And the other piece, of course, is to understand a little bit more about your family history, whether there's any risks to you um, or potentially your child uh, based on your family history. Um, there's a couple of things that your doctor may talk with you about uh, optimizing prior to proceeding with fertility treatment. Um, so healthy habits, you know, avoiding um, habits that are hazardous to your health. Um, such as smoking um, or other um, use, use of drugs and things like that, really working towards a healthy weight. Um, we can't all get to a, a perfect or ideal body weight before starting treatment, but at least heading in that direction and starting those healthy habits that can stick with you in pregnancy um, to optimize your chance of, of having a healthy pregnancy and a healthy baby. And that includes regular exercise, making sure you're getting about uh, 150 minutes of exercise per week. You can break that up as you wish. 30 minute segments, 50 minute segments, um, but consistent regular exercise um, such that um, you know you are working towards reducing insulin resistance and optimizing your health and also optimizing um, you know your mood, getting some endorphins, very, very important part of, um, of getting healthy for pregnancy. 
We talked a little bit about this, um, but you want to, if you're a smoker, you want to stop vaping or smoking, um, starting a prenatal vitamin, no drugs, um, including marijuana when you're on your pregnancy journey, um, and minimizing alcohol. For most of us, that means one drink or less per day on average, um, uh, because heavier alcohol use, um, about two drinks per day or higher, is associated with decreased or impaired fertility outcomes. And of course, um, no drinking when you're pregnant because that can uh, impose a risk of fetal alcohol syndrome. Okay, let's go into some of those treatment options. I'm sure there's gonna be plenty of questions um, about these as well. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about insemination. I think that'll probably be a significant part of our discussion today. So I'll start off with some highlights about insemination. Um, we'll we're gonna be talking specifically about um, office-based insemination, but I'm happy to take some questions about home-based insemination if you have some as well. Um, and then fertility preservation, a lot more people coming in for fertility preservation, either freezing of eggs or creating embryos with partner or with donor sperm. Um, a lot more insurance companies are starting to offer this elective uh, fertility preservation benefit. So I'm seeing a lot more patients coming in inquiring about this um, and kind of being proactive in terms of preserving their fertility, especially if they intend to defer uh, pregnancy and childbearing um, into later years, um, or if they have any family history of infertility and they're concerned about facing the same thing at a later age. We're going to talk about IVF or in vitro fertilization. And then we're also going to talk about a really neat strategy called reciprocal IVF, where um, both partners, if they're assigned female at birth, can participate very intimately in the process of having a baby. Um, egg donation and surrogacy are options for all of our patients, including our LGBTQ patient population, um, albeit you know not not necessarily as widely utilized um, for female couples, um, but but still potential options. If you have any specific questions about those, I won't be talking too much about those uh, today as part of the introduction. But if you have any specific questions about those, um, please uh, please ping us so I can answer those as well. All right, so let's talk about IUI or intrauterine insemination. So we often call that TDI at our clinic or therapeutic donor insemination. And in most cases, if you're under age 35, you're gonna be advised to complete around six cycles of treatment with insemination um, to give yourself your best chances of success. There's some data that's coming out that the best chances of success are going to be in the first three or four treatment cycles um, of those six cycles, that the reproductive success rates don't increase marginally as much in the fifth and sixth cycle. So uh, we are, you know, some, some folks are kind of weighing that and considering moving forward to a more successful treatment such as IVF, if not successful after three or four cycles. Um, but generally the chances of success are quite good uh, with donor sperm. Typically we're looking at success rates in the 15 to 20% um, success rate per cycle and cumulative success rates about 70 to 80%. So quite good if you're under age 35. Um, one important thing to note is that when the insemination is happening, we are using one full vial of donor sperm, and that's going to be sperm uh, that's prepared for intracervical or intrauterine insemination. So you'll see it labeled as ICI or IUI on the donor sperm bank, sperm bank websites. And it's a pretty simple procedure, actually. We um, time your ovulation. You can either do that at home with ovulation kits, or we can take care of that for you and do the blood work and ultrasound monitoring. So there's a little bit less stress. And if there's any ambiguity about your cycles or you need to take medications to induce ovulation, then the monitoring is very, very key um, to assessing and um, uh, aligning the right time for the insemination to happen. The goal for that is to uh, do the insemination a couple of hours before the egg or the eggs, depending on the treatment, uh, are being released from the ovary. So um, typically we align that timing. And then um, the procedure, kind of like a pap smear, you're typically uh, in the same position as you would be to get a pap smear. And then a very slender catheter, usually the same kind of caliber or um, diameter as a spaghetti noodle, so very slender, is um, placed through the cervix and then the sperm is instilled into the uterine cavity. For most people, this is um, pain-free or mostly pain-free. Some people may have some cramping associated with that. And of course there is the, um, the speculum, you know, so there is uh, there can be a little bit of discomfort with that. And you can certainly have your partner with you at the time of the insemination. so you can both participate in that, okay? If you're older, if you're over age 35, we usually recommend um, 
proceeding with a more aggressive treatment like IVF after three cycles are not successful, maybe four cycles, depending on your particular case, um, because the chances of success per treatment cycle are a little lower, um, even if you're not infertile, even if you've never tried for pregnancy before, they're about 10 to 15% per cycle. So the cumulative success rates are about 50% over the course of three to six rounds. And so more people would need a more aggressive treatment option um, like IVF, and many insurances will also cover it at that point in your journey if you haven't been successful with insemination. I did put a couple of costs here, um, just in sight for you. Um, many insurances will cover some, some treatment costs. If they don't cover it, it's about $500 for the IUI itself and about twelve dollars to $1,400 for the monitored cycle. So you can speak with your clinician and figure out which uh, pathway is right for you. Um, but in many cases, if you're able to track your cycles, the ovulation-based approach is a nice sort of less expensive way to enter into treatment. And the cost of a vial of donor sperm varies a little bit based on the sperm bank. Um, typically, um, we we work with all sperm banks, um, but the main three that we um, typically see patients purchasing from, and we have links to those on our websites, are um, California Cryobank, Fairfax Cryobank, and Seattle Sperm Bank. And so you're going to um, see those links and you'll be able to take a look at those and you'll be able to take a look at pricing as well. Um, they're pretty transparent, you know, usually about 800 to $1,000 per vial of sperm um, may have maybe increasing a little bit and the inventory is constantly changing. So if you don't find what you're looking for, you know, check back and check multiple sites. IVF, I want to mention a little bit about IVF treatment and compare and contrast it to IUI. IVF is highly successful, and particularly if you're under age 35, the success rates of IVF treatment can be as high as 50% for treatment cycles, so extremely high, and much higher than IUI, but may not be indicated at the first step of your journey. For most people uh, presenting with the use of donor sperm, they're not infertile. You know, they haven't tried for pregnancy before. They haven't been pregnant before, so insemination is often the right starting place, but IVF is a very good backup option, and in some cases, like uh, cases of fallopian tube obstruction. If your fallopian tubes are blocked, it actually will be your first, uh, your first starting place. IVF, unlike IUI, requires injection medication to stimulate the ovary. Usually you're taking those for about eight to 12 days and coming in for routine blood work and ultrasound pretty frequently every couple of days during the stimulation. So it's a busy stretch. You're taking the shots at night and coming in for the monitoring every couple of days um, in the mornings. Um, we at Boston IVF, have, Boston IVF have a lot of satellite locations. Um, so you'll find, you know, take a look at our website, see our geography, but hopefully you'll find a center that's close and convenient for you. Um, there's lots in the Boston location, um, Waltham, Brookline, Stoneham, Quincy, um, and then we're out in Western Mass as well. So a lot of clinic options available. Um, we also have New Hampshire and Rhode Island um, and Maine. So take a look and see what's most convenient for you. And also our representatives can always let you know what would be the closest site for you. In terms of IVF, one of the additional benefits of uh, IVF is that you can choose to genetically test the embryos that are created from IVF. Uh, and so that genetic testing can be a huge draw, either for people who have genetic diseases that they're trying to test for in the embryos, or actually... Um, to test embryos for chromosomes to understand whether the embryos are chromosomally healthy or normal or chromosomally abnormal. And that could result in miscarriage or a child with a chromosomal abnormality. So with IVF, we can actually test the embryos because the eggs are extracted in IVF combined with sperm in the laboratory. And then um, embryos are cultured in the lab and they can be tested. IVF is a lot more expensive than IUI. Um, we are seeing, you know, very good coverage for IVF treatment, however, um, and more encompassing treatment um, that's uh, impacting um, in a very positive way L LGBTQ population. So, um, you know, check with your plan. Even if you don't think you have coverage, you might have something. So if you um, are interested in this pathway, definitely check with our financial coordinator to see if any, any coverage exists. I did mention a little bit about reciprocal IVF. Um, that's again for two um, individuals who are assigned female at birth um, who would like to both participate in a very intimate way in the process of having a child. It requires one partner to undergo the ovarian stimulation process and then have the surgery to extract the eggs. And then um, embryos are created in the laboratory with the use of donor sperm. 
And then the embryo can either be transferred into a synchronized cycle into her partner, or it can potentially um, be frozen, maybe genetically tested and transferred in a separate cycle um, where the partner uh, has the uterine lining prepared to receive the embryo. So obviously an opportunity for amazing and tremendous in involvement of both partners and really excellent uh, success rates. Um, we've studied our uh, success rates with partner assisted reproduction or reciprocal IVF, and they're really, really fantastic. Um, in, in most cases, in most age groups, better than conventional IVF treatment, mostly because there typically isn't a strong history of infertility for couples who are considering reciprocal IVF. Um, also, we have uh, fertility preservation options um, for transgender individuals, um, and we are really a center that's um, uh, done a lot of work in this area to not only um, help support our trans individuals undergoing fertility preservation treatment, but also to educate and inform other fertility clinics that aren't don't have as much experience. Um, so we've done a lot of research in this area and published a lot of good studies to uh, inform individual inform providers about um, kind of standard of care um, and put some data into a, a an area that was sort of data free where there weren't wasn't a lot of experience with trans individuals going through um, a fertility preservation. So um, for transgender males, um, egg freezing or um, tissue freezing of the ovarian tissue are, are options. Some uh, transmasculine individuals will actually opt to carry pregnancy as well um, with insemination with donor sperm or in some cases partner sperm. And the reciprocal IVF could be an excellent option as well. Um, particularly for our trans folks who are joining in today, um, some of the things that we've done at our center is to really uh, help try to help facilitate an open inclusive environment. Um, you know, there's a lot more insurance coverage coming through for um, fertility preservation for trans individuals, um, including, you know, the sort of standard Massachusetts-based plans have very good coverage, typically for one treatment cycle. Um, and one thing that I always share with our trans masculine folks is that it is possible um, to consider doing a treatment cycle for egg freezing without actually inducing a period prior to treatment. So you may not need to be off testosterone for a very long period of time, and you may be able to actually accomplish a treatment cycle without having um, uh, amenities. Um, and so that is something you should talk to your provider about, um, and um, I'm happy to help in any way that I can. One thing that we can also do is transabdominal ultrasounds just to help kind of facilitate um, it being a little bit more of a comfortable um, uh, process for you. And we can do some less uh, frequent or more um, flexible monitoring for you if needed as well. And ultimately, I think a lot of this comes down to rapport with your medical provider, talking about what you're comfortable with, what you're not comfortable with, um, and then finding a plan that suits you. Um, this is one of um, our larger studies that came out in 2019 um, on assisted reproductive technology outcomes in female to male transgender patients. Um, this is really uh, the leading study back in 2019 that came out. And what it really showed is that um, when we matched patients who had gone through um, a treatment, trans individuals who had gone through treatment, um, their success rates were similar, if not better, to most patients who are cisgender undergoing fertility treatment. And there did not appear to be any impact of testosterone use, any adverse impact on reproductive outcomes, including um, IVF treatment with the intent of creating embryos or transferring embryos for pregnancy. And most individuals were successful within one treatment cycle of achieving the number of eggs or embryos that they were looking for. So I'm going to wrap up um, my my chatting and get to your questions. Um, and here is our phone number. This is our um, general phone number that you can call if you um, have any questions or if you'd like to establish care. Um, so I'm going to leave this up, um, and then I'm going to uh, start taking some of these questions um, that you all have shared with us today. So let's go to... Um, number question number one. Okay. So the very first question is, can I do IVF with a low AMH? So AMH, um, just coming back to, uh, that for those of us, those who kind of joined on afterwards, um, AMH is the anti-malarian hormone, and that is an indicator of egg count. So the number of remaining eggs on the ovary it doesn't actually quantitatively count exactly the number of eggs that you have, but it is a represent, re representative value of the total egg pool that's remaining. 
And in fact, you can do IVF um, with a low AMH. Um, that is a diagnosis of diminished ovarian reserve. And many of our patients, um, even many of our successful patients have that diagnosis. But it may be important to look at specific protocols that are more successful in patients with a low AMH. And it may also um, prompt more aggressive treatment sooner in your journey. So whereas patients with a normal AMH and normal egg count um, may be likely to do more uh, cycles of treatment, maybe with insemination um, or less aggressive modalities, um, if you have a low AMH, you may be uh, moving forward to a more aggressive treatment option first or early in your journey to try to maximize your chances of success. So yes, definitely, um, definitely an option. Okay, so we're going to go to Q&A. Perfect. Um, and then uh, an uh, anonymous attendee asks, what is the success rate of donor sperm and IVF? So um, in terms of the success rate, it really varies by age. Um, if you want to get a little bit of a better understanding of age-related success rates, just for like general patients as a whole, you can look at um, the Society for Assisted Reproductive Technology, or SART. It'll give you the anticipated success rates per treatment cycle. Um, however, if you are somebody with a good egg count and you don't have infertility and you're using donor sperm, which typically is going to be verified to be consistent and high quality, the success rates for you may actually be higher than those age-related expected success rates. So definitely talk with your provider about that. Um, they are for catch-all for everybody doing fertility treatment for different indications. And so um, your specific success rates may look a little bit different than that. That's where it's really important to speak with a reproductive specialist, understand where you fall. Okay. All right, uh, anonymous number two, uh, two chicas here. Hello, chicas. Um, number one, so uh, patient number one is 31, overweight, PCOS with type two diabetes, partner is 38 and healthy. Um, and with uh, the second partner being 38, her age is a factor. Um, is it a decent bet that we would use her eggs over mine considering my added health factors? Um, thank you so much uh, for um, thanking us for this. Um, really nice to see you. Um, so generally, if you are both interested in becoming genetic parents, um, and you would both like to have a child using your eggs at some point, it would be beneficial for the older partner to start with treatment first. Um, many people still have really good fertility at age 38. So I'm, I'm not, I'm not so worried about right now, but it could be time sensitive. So fertility success rates are way better under age 40 than they are over age 40. So definitely time is of the essence if she is interested in getting, um, in having a genetically related child. Now, in terms of how you decide to proceed, if it's gonna be insemination or IVF treatment, that depends a little bit upon your unique situation. I'm happy to help out. Feel free to call the center if I can um, uh, help in your case. But I think even with being overweight, PCOS and a type two diabetic, there are likely still very good treatment options available for you. Um, and in your case, I think what I would really, um, uh, start off with is, is meeting with a high-risk pregnancy specialist and understanding what pregnancy might be like for you. And also what kind of things can you do to optimize um, your journey to pregnancy, especially if your partner is interested in carrying the first pregnancy, you may have a couple years, you know, um, so you may have some time to optimize your health conditions and really uh, pave the way for your healthiest pregnancy. Great question. Um, and then Amanda asks, um, if you've had all reproductive health tests done by another doctor in the last year, um, would Boston IVF require them to be done again prior to continuing treatment? Um, the answer is it depends. Um, it depends on how the testing results looked. Were they all normal? Um, was there any concern uh, for ovarian decline? In which case we might need to get up to the minute testing results and we may recommend you update it. Or if you're really close to that one year mark, typically our Massachusetts insurances require everything to be updated every year. And so if, it, if you're kind of right on the nose, then we may recommend that you update it again. Also, every health center does things a little bit differently, you know, just like in your workplace or your industry, there's probably, you kind of do things a little bit differently than your competitor. So there may be um, some things that just haven't simply been done for you, or you haven't had a full reproductive health assessment. And so in that case, we may recommend doing some updated testing. Um, but it's always wise to check. Um, and, you know, if, 
those testing is being recommended is because it may influence ultimately your course of treatment. So it's, you know, certainly um, for good reason. Um, Anonymous asks, um, my wife and I have done six at-home inseminations. Could I be infertile? Is it time to see a fertility doctor? I have basic testing with my gynecologist, but I think I may need more help. Uh, I agree. I agree. If you've done six home inseminations, um, and if you've had kind of a basic fertility workup, it's likely that there's some things that have not yet been tested or offered for you. So I would strongly recommend that you meet with um, a reproductive endocrinologist to get a little bit more insight. Um, and you may start at this point looking at um, clinic-based inseminations. It depends if you're working with a known donor um, or if you're working with um, a frozen donor sperm bank. Um, you know, if you are working with a frozen donor sperm bank, we talked about the price, you probably invested quite a bit of money into purchasing donor sperm. You may be five or $6,000 into it. So I think it's a really good time to fully evaluate your fertility and see if there's anything that can improve your chances of success. Um, at minimum, you know, try a couple rounds with in some insemination in the clinic, intrauterine insemination, because likely at home you're doing um, intracervical insemination or intra intravaginal insemination. So yeah, perfect time to get a get a checkup done before you invest any more time and you know physical and emotional time as well. I think that's really important to understand. It's like a you know it really weighs on you probably to not have been successful to date. So let's see what we can do to help. Okay, Charlotte. Um, Charlotte asks, I would like to understand a little bit more about reciprocal IVF. Would I be able to provide more information on this topic? So Charlotte poses question at 720. Um, so I think we probably have talked about this a little bit, but let me jump in one more time, just in case somebody else has joined on or, um, maybe, um, she wanted more information. So Reciprocal IVF is a process where one partner undergoes stimulation of the ovaries, um, doing the conventional steps of IVF treatment. So take shots for eight to 12 days, um, has the monitoring, has the egg retrieval. So one partner undergoes a surgery to extract the eggs. A, a vial of donor sperm is thawed out. The eggs are combined together in a dish. And then we watch the embryos develop over a five to seven day period. We can choose to transfer back an embryo into her partner's uterus the same time. So that would be a coordinated cycle. It's hard to do, okay? So most cycles aren't done this way, but it is possible with the use of birth control pills to align the reproductive cycles such that an embryo can actually be transferred back into the partner's uterus real time. Okay. That's really, really cool. And it works. It was, you know, highly successful, but uh, it's a little tricky uh, to do. So. Um, Let's keep that in mind. Um, I'm just gonna, I got a little feedback to turn off my screen share here. So let me not do that, just one second. Okay, perfect. I think you can still see me here. Um, perfect. So, um, and then in terms of uh, the other approach, in terms of reciprocal IVF, optimizing um, uh, the plan for embryo transfer, the other partner has to have uh, the uterus evaluated to make sure that the uterus is anatomically normal um, and that um, she's healthy for pregnancy. That's very important. Um, and then uh, the embryo can be transferred back in uh, multiple different cycle approaches. Um, and so um, it's a highly successful treatment. The success rates can be uh, greater than 50% for treatment cycle. Um, if the embryo has been genetically tested and normal, um, it can be as high as 60 to 70% for treatment cycle. So very, very good, um, particularly if the partners are young. So great treatment option. Um, if you want to learn more about it, we'll schedule a consult. We can give you some more insight. Okay. Um, reciprocal Is reciprocal IVF possible across states? For example, my partner and I may not have eggs either of us can use, and her sister is willing to donate eggs to us, but they live a, a plane right away. Um, so this would be actually called egg donation um, if it's from somebody outside of your relationship. And um, yes, egg donation, um, known donor, and known an egg donor, yes, that could be performed across states. Um, but uh, this relative would need to be uh, carefully assessed. That may be better if it's closer to their geography, less expensive to fly them over to the fertility clinic. So probably getting tested with their OBGYN for candidacy or uh, clinic local to them would be a good idea. Um, but certainly if you're considering egg donation um, and you're already partnering with us, for example, at Boston IVF, then um, we're happy to do that screening for you as well. Okay. 
Um, next question is how many vials of sperm should be used for the first round? So we use one vial of sperm per treatment cycle. Uh, for an IUI, that whole vial of sperm has to be used because we want to maximize the amount of sperm that's entering the uterus uh, to meet the egg. So the chance of success are highest if we use the whole vial. Uh, <clears throat> for IVF, it is possible to just use a fraction of the vial. And we do that sometimes for patients who have a really strong interest in preserving the same genetic parent for both of their children, or really are intent, of course, in both carrying a pregnancy, but in really intent on using the same sperm donor. And so if there's only a little bit of sperm left, it's possible to do IVF treatment and just use a fraction of a vial of sperm in many cases. Um, and then uh, Vanessa also asks, do all eggs that have been frozen used or can they be divided? So I think this question is relating to egg freezing. Um, so if you've frozen your eggs previously and you intend to thaw them out, you can just thaw out a fraction of the eggs. So we typically freeze two eggs per vial. Some clinics freeze four eggs per vial or straw. So you can um, thaw them in any sort of distribution um, of the way that they're, that they're frozen, but usually you don't have to thaw all of them. That's a plan that you can make with your provider. Um, and it can be, you know, related to the situation that you're in at that time. Do you want to use all those eggs, you know? Um, and in many cases, the answer is no. And so we only thaw out a portion. Um, okay. Can you explain the difference between IUI and ICI sperm? Is one better than the other? It relates to the degree that the sperm has been washed and prepared for transfer. So um, for IUI, um, the sperm is washed. It's a strip of proteins that can be irritating to the uterine lining. And so um, that's really the main difference. Usually the numbers for ICI are going to be a little better because the washing step has not been performed yet. So as far as like the total count of sperm that's usable for IUI, it's about the same, but the ICI vials have not been um, have not been washed and prepared yet. So typically, if you're going to use that vial for IUI, your clinic will be responsible for the washing step to make sure that it's safe and that you're not going to have kind of a chemical reaction or an irritation from placing that sperm into the uterine cavity. Molly asks, if we had already had a baby via home insemination and now we're 40 years old, can we go straight to IVF? Um, possibly, uh, depending on the circumstances. Um, you may still consider insemination in certain cases, depending on how long your first journey was. If it took a sh very short time and your fertility testing looks really good, you could still consider insemination. Um, you know, the question I think sometimes is also in relationship to coverage, are you going to be covered for that? And with many insurances, there will be like a requisite number of insemination cycles that would be needed before your insurance will uh, pay for the IVF treatment. Um, but that is highly individual. So obviously worth looking into and checking in with the clinic about that. Um, but in some cases, it does make sense based on your um, ovarian reserve testing um, or other parameters, including anatomy, to consider uh, going straight to IVF treatment. Um, but in many cases, insemination may still be may still be a wise choice. Um, and then Molly also asks, what are the chances of multiples using IVF with donor sperm? So that's multiple pregnancy. Uh, the chances can be actually very low of multiple pregnancy with IVF. Um, most of the time we're doing single embryo transfer. That's putting back one, the top quality embryo, particularly with the use of genetic testing of embryos. Once an embryo has been genetically tested, the chances of success could be um, as high as 50 or 60% per embryo. And so then we um, uh, only transfer back one embryo at a time. Um, but in some cases, if you're above the age of 38 or 40 um, and you're not using genetic testing, multiple embryos will be transferred. But the chances of multiple pregnancy, um, even with the transfer of multiple embryos over age 40, are still relatively low, typically less than 5%. Depends a little bit on your testing parameters and the quality of the embryos, but generally it's safe to transfer back multiple embryos without a very high risk of multiple pregnancy. But one of the ways you can avoid that is to use genetic testing of embryos. Um, and that's a very, very valuable tool, um, especially with advancing maternal age. Um, Anonymous asks, are there any supplements suggested for women with low AMH? Thank you. Um, Coenzyme Q10 is, um, is worthwhile if you have a uh, low ovarian reserve and it's thought that you have um, aging ovaries or poor quality eggs. 
Quinzam Q10, there's some, some compelling data for that. It's very inexpensive, um, virtually side effect free. So that's a reasonable supplement to take. Not a lot of data about other supplements. You know, there's a lot of books out there. There's a lot of misinformation, unfortunately, about supplements that can sort of fix your fertility or change your egg count. Unfortunately, that's based on genetics. Um, but uh, taking a prenatal vitamin, optimizing your general health, um, and considering CoQ10, that um, those parameters can help. Next question. Um, uh, this patient is 37, has a low AMH, uh, but otherwise healthy, has unfortunately not been successful with two IUIs. Um, do I think it's worth trying one more IUI or proceeding straight to IVF? Um, well, I don't know your full clinical story, so I can't provide specific clinical guidance, but uh, I can tell you in general terms, um, I think the chances of I IUI um, are, are fairly reasonable without a history of infertility. Um, and the best cumulative chances of success are typically seen after sort of, you know, three to four treatment cycles. So depending on what is your individual scenario, maybe, um, maybe wise to consider an additional IUI, particularly if you're incurring a very high expense with IVF treatment. IUI is much less complex. Um, it can be done pretty quickly. It usually takes a little bit of time to coordinate for IVF treatment. Um, you may just take a month off to do so. Um, so maybe reasonable to consider that, but you know, happy to review your case um, if you want to set up an appointment for more specifics. But um, you know, I think uh, I think that pathway would be reasonable. Um, okay, does insurance cover reciprocal IVF? The answer is sometimes and increasingly, increasingly so. We're seeing that through insurance companies um, having riders, so specific um, uh, policies written in that basically their employer has opted to cover this benefit. And what's really neat is that it usually comes from just a grassroots effort of the various employees kind of coming together saying, we really like this benefit. Is this something you can offer? So if you are interested in something like that at your workplace, talk to your HR rep. Um, this is how this is how the coverage starts. So talk to them, maybe they're here, here's something similar from other employees. And then hopefully um, within a year or two, you can have um, something like this in your workplace too. Um, Dela asks, I am also 38 and my AMH level um, last month was one. Is this reassuring to carry a sperm donor pregnancy? So AMH of one is actually a normal AMH, particularly with advancing age. Um, so uh, it's technically not abnormal. It's kind of at the cusp of normal versus abnormal, but I'm not outside of the parameters uh, expected for age, a little on the lower side, but uh, could be reasonable to proceed with, with any treatment choice. Um, so um, good luck, uh, fingers crossed, and, um, and uh, let us know if we can help. Um, okay, what are the differences in success rates for at-home insemination versus doing it in a medical office? Um, the best available data tells us about twice as effective to do it in the office. It's a little hard to capture this data because we can't get all the information from the, uh, the folks doing it at home. Um, but in the best available studies I've seen, it shows that it's probably up to twice as effective in the office setting. So certainly if you've not been successful at home, that would be a very good time to come in and, and get evaluated for, for office insemination, for, for example, for that patient or for that person who asked us about it for their own journey. Um, and then we have another question. Does Boston IVF do double inseminations? That means two inseminations in the same month. Um, the answer to that is that we can. Um, we don't typically because the success rates are very marginally increased for a double insemination um, to do it twice in one month as opposed to one time. And the cost, of course, is so much higher. You have to pay for that additional procedure and the additional vial of sperm. But we certainly can do it. And there are clinical scenarios where it makes a lot of sense to do it. So talk with your provider if that's something you want to consider. Um, and uh, and you're, you're not kind of shy of the additional using the additional vial of sperm. Um, Jules asks, what resources would I recommend to help decide between donor sperm versus using a known donor? Um, well, the first is really um, is really to a uh, quarantine um, that sperm sample. Um, we are now actually able to offer that in-house uh, very recently. We weren't able to do it for, for a long time, several regulatory requirements and things. And so we are able to do that now. So if you're interested, um, definitely check in, make an appointment with the doctor um, to discuss that. Um, you can also use an outside cryobank like New England Cryobank or ReproCheck or other sort of regional cryobanks to do that. Um, 
Uh, I will caution that it does take a little bit of time to quarantine that sperm, three to six months, depending on where you're doing it. Um, and then you, there is a cost. I mean, there's a cost of screening the donor. So it's usually in the realm of two to $3,000. Um, and that donor has to be screened now. And then just before the sperm is released to you for use. So if you are in a setting where you must start treatment in a very time sensitive way, it may not be your best option, but if you have some time and you're presenting early in your journey, you know, to kind of figure out all options, um, talk with your doctor about it. And we can actually offer a uh, quarantine for that potential known sperm donor uh, at our location now. Um, if I use a sperm donor, can I go straight to IVF? Or is IVF only used when, do known, when donor insemination is not working? Um, and the answer is it depends. Um, in some cases, it, it may be a consideration to go straight to IVF um, based on anatomic issues, um, age potentially, or other issues. Um, but typical pathway is for attempting with donor sperm insemination, IUI, first, and then proceeding to IVF. Um, so that is more typical, uh, especially if your parameters are normal and um, you know, you're know you under age 40. But there are uh, alternative considerations for that. Also, if you're considering creating uh, surplus embryos for embryo prior preservation. Um, can I spell that supplement name? Uh, I think you're probably referring to coenzyme Q10. So co, C-O, Q, uh, 10, the number 10. Um, could I share the insurances that cover IVF? Well, <laughs> um, in Massachusetts, we have our uh, major providers, our Blue Cross Blue Shield, Harvard Pilgrim, Tufts, um, and uh, Mass General Brigham. There's also some GIC plans um, government uh, for government employees. Um, there's a lot of uh, additional plans that are coming out that are supporting very broad access to fertility treatment. Um, some names are Progeny, uh, Carrot. Um, there's some um, uh, good fertility coverage through United Healthcare and Aetna. Um, so, you know, we're seeing a lot of uh, workplaces really opt in for broader coverage uh, for their constituent employees. So definitely start there if you're not, if your workplace doesn't offer coverage. Um, okay. And we just have three more questions. Um, so we'll, we'll wrap up with those. Okay. Um, this question is, what are the genetic testing needed for Asian women? Uh, my wife and I have one child that's healthy, but we did have a microcephaly or sorry, small head size diagnosis. Um, what genetic testing would we need? I would recommend that you meet with a genetic counselor if you have, if your child has any um, residual issues related to that. Um, but um, particularly the conditions that can be more common as a carrier condition in the Asian population include um, different kinds of thalassemias or anemias. Um, so potentially you may have been screened for that in your pregnancy. Um, and then of course, there's um, some other conditions that have um, a baseline incidence in the Asian population. Generally, we recommend screening for cystic fibrosis and spinal muscular atrophy in everybody. And then um, some broader uh, screening according to your ethnicity. Or a lot of the time we're using these large panels that test for two, three, or 400 conditions for most patients. I'll give you the most breadth of insight. Um, does Boston IVF do acupuncture um, before egg retrieval and before and after embryo transfer? Uh, yes, we have a very large suite of um, alternative therapies, um, including acupuncture in our wellness center. So yes, we do. We have a lot of patients that do acupuncture. We have some excellent acupuncturists um, that are very renowned for this. Um, the most study time is actually before and after embryo transfer, and they're very flexible um, in um, uh, scheduling that for a patient. So it's really wonderful if you're looking for something, even on if your transfer falls in a weekend, they're um, they're typically able to accommodate. Um, and then lastly, is there a risk of CMV related complications with a CMV positive donor? Um, that risk is very small if if at all present. So it's probably largely a theoretical risk because the donors are always screened for CMV. Um, active infection, and then history of CMV um, antibodies. So we've all learned a lot about antibodies over the last three years. 
Um, and so with an antibody, it relates to um, mounting antibodies towards a prior exposure. No donors are ever accepted into the donor pool if they have an active CMV infection. So the risk of transmission of actual CMV through the seminal fluid is incredibly low. Um, and particularly that applies to IVF treatment where there's really not a meaningful amount of seminal fluid that's transferred with the embryo. Um, so although there's some risk, it's like likely minor, talk with your doctor about this um, when you're deciding um, how to select a sperm donor. Okay. And last one, perfect timing. Uh, Molly says, thank you so much. And I thank you all uh, for a wonderful session. And um, yeah, really happy to, to do this all for you. And let me know if we can be helpful to you in your journey at any point. Okay. Um, and have a wonderful Pride Month. I'm really honored to kick this all off. Um, and we'll be doing lots of cool um, other events and um, lots of cool functions and things like that on our social media. So keep an eye out over the course of the next month. Bye, everyone.